Hey everyone, so I think we should get started. Uh, for the two of you who are already here, Ashwin and Nikhil, hello. And uh, for everyone else who's not here yet, I hope you'll be here soon. Um, if you missed part of this, you can catch up on YouTube. There is a copy of the live stream. And we, as usual, have our guest appearance. And say bye. Um, so today we have my colleague from the Intercept and we have Vivek Durai from Paper VC in conversation on Zoom's security uh, versus business interests. Vivek can set an agenda better than I can, so I'll let him do that. But uh, just to introduce our two panelists for tonight, my colleague, um, for, right for the Intercept, he for security. Um, he's also a founder of the Freedom of the Press Foundation. Uh, I believe trustee or founder, I don't know what the term you use of that. And um, Michael has been pointing out several serious issues with Zoom that have been reported in various places. And thanks to that, I think uh, we now have a larger understanding of what risks that we have taken up when we use Zoom for our conversations. Vivek comes to it from a business perspective. Vivek is a lawyer by training, a programmer by hobby and an entrepreneur by profession at this point. Vivek's paper VC provides information on what's going on with uh, signal intelligence on businesses in India. Uh, Vivek, again, can do a better job of introducing this than I can. And between the two of them, I've heard some fairly fascinating takes on how to interpret Zoom's security. Do you say Zoom is insecure, therefore don't use it? Or do you say it's all fine, just use it? Um, and I think this between these two extremes, there's a fair bit of territory to be covered, which I will let our panelists take on for today. So Vivek, uh, do you want to take over from you? Sure. Thanks, uh, Kiran. Uh, Micah, it was good chatting uh, today morning. In fact, Micah and I connected earlier uh, today uh, to go over some of the, 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 the things, the standpoints and perspectives that we have and, and some that we share. Um, I think the, the easiest way to get started with this is to, uh, is to understand how The Intercept uh, developed this story. Um, and, and, and then we can discuss a range of topics, uh, including the repercussions of the impact and, and, the, and, and the worldwide response to, uh, to Zoom's vulnerabilities. Uh, Michael, do you want to tell us how, how this started? How did you get um, start with the story about Zoom at a time when this was a fairly popular tool already. Yeah. Um, so, so the so I've written a couple of stories about Zoom, um, but the first one that I wrote was about how, uh, like, if you went to Zoom's website and you looked at the security information and you read their security white paper, they claimed that Zoom was end-to-end -end encrypted, um, but uh, we figured out that it actually wasn't end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, I worked on it with uh, Yaul uh, Gower, who is another journalist, uh, and she was the one who was actually talking to Zoom, but basically she was talking to Zoom, she was talking to um, Slack and a bunch of other companies that have kind of been exploded in use ever since the pandemic started, um, trying to understand more information about uh, how their privacy stuff worked. And um, uh, so she was asking Zoom a bunch of questions and including questions about how it was encrypted. And um, uh, like specifically with Zoom, um, the fact that, it, that they were saying that it was end-to-end -end encrypted was like kind of a really big deal because with uh, most stuff on the internet is not end-to-end -end encrypted. It's kind of very rare for things to be encrypted in this way. And what this means is that if you um, uh, send someone a message and uh, using a service that's not encrypted, like Facebook, like if you're just sending someone a Facebook message, um, Facebook has access to the content of, of the entire conversation. And then also Facebook, uh, so, you know, employees maybe have access to it, but Facebook could also be compelled by governments to hand this over. So if you are, um, you know, an activist, if you're a journalist talking to sources or, um, you know, uh, any number of other uh, reasons why you might have some like very real privacy needs, um, 
Facebook could be compelled to help spy on you. Uh, and so if Zoom says that they're end-to-end -end encrypted, then that means that Zoom could not be compelled to help spy on you, right? So if you're, if you're having like a Zoom meeting and uh, it says that it's end-to-end -end encrypted and you trust this, then um, uh, uh, if it's like very, like maybe you have a sensitive business meeting, you're talking about trade secrets or whatever, you might feel very confident to use, to use Zoom for this meeting. Um, but, uh, but it turned out that that wasn't true. And, and, and we basically figured this out because uh, Yell was asking them specific detailed questions about how their encryption works. And here, let me see, they finally told her, uh, uh, and this was a Zoom spokesperson, like one of their um, uh, like public relations people. Uh, they said, currently it's not possible to enable end-to-end -end encryption for Zoom video meetings. Zoom video meetings use a combination of TCP and UDP. TCP connections are made using TLS and UDP connections are encrypted with AES using a key negotiated over TLS. So there's like a lot of technical stuff in there. But basically, uh, how fast uh, was this back, back and forth? So was there, was there a long email trail, conversations? Uh, no, this was the um, time so, you started? So I wasn't actually uh, part of, of this communication. The other uh, Yael was, but... Um, it was uh, email, and basically the way that it worked with their uh, PR people was she would write them an email with a bunch of questions and then wait for them to like come up with a response that they were happy with being quoted, and then they'd send her a response, and then she would like email them with a bunch of follow-up questions and then wait for a response. So it was kind of like slow getting information out of them. And... Um, but I think that like, you know, our reporting and also a lot of the other reporting about the privacy and security issues that Zoom has kind of made them do a complete flip on how they've been dealing with this stuff. And instead of being very... Um, sure, I, 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 yeah, I, I think I wanted to get to that a little bit later. Uh, I, the, I'm a little more curious about, um, about how you get started with a story like this. Uh, and, and, so I have a couple of theories and you can help me out on, on which of those uh, are more accurate. Uh, is it because you specialize in an area that requires you to look at um, the security of the tools that you use, that you evaluate at Zoom, uh, you and uh, the colleague that you mentioned? Uh, was that the reason you started looking at Zoom and asking them specific questions over there, already indications that uh, that there might be vulnerabilities. Is this anything to give it away? Uh, apart from the claim that it's end to end and, and, and therefore suspect in, in your eyes. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, really, it was just that we were evaluating Zoom. Like, like you know, since um, since January and February, I personally have been using Zoom a lot more often for a lot more meetings, and um, there's definitely. Uh, so I am the director of information security for The Intercept. So I have to have uh, meetings with um, a lot of uh, a, a lot of people related to like sensitive topics. So we haven't like a need for having secure communication, and especially where everything is um, everyone is working from home right now. This all has to be remote. It all has to be over the internet. And so um, basically, like like Zoom, you know, even with all of these privacy issues, Zoom is fine for a lot of use cases, right? Like I think that Zoom is fine for uh, like, r regardless of its encryption for having like a yoga class, right? <laughs> or, or whatever, for like a lot of things like that. But if you, if you, if your threat model says that you need to have um, uh, a private conversation, then, uh, you know, Zoom, according to their marketing, seemed like you needed to have it, uh, uh, but in reality, it wasn't. But yeah, really, I mean, I think that that we, uh, me and Yael, were like looking into services, specifically like the technical claims of services and specifically security and privacy, because that's uh, largely what, that's the work that I do and that's what I focus on. Um, and if it's true that Zoom is really like very secure for um, all sorts of use cases, that's that's that will be great news. And so, uh, just so we started looking into it, and the fact that they kind of like they had, they published a white paper, a security white paper, and their white paper 
said a bunch of stuff but didn't really explain it very much it's, it just was very hand wavy and we're like but how does this work is this is this true is this real so we were just so asking the, the white people came out uh, a while after you started uh, engaging with them or there was an existing white paper that they switched yeah, you just there was an existing white paper sure um, so when did this all start this this is uh feb early march when did it happen um that's a good question i think um i think early march i believe like we published the story in in late march and so i think that yell was starting to talk to them and other companies too in in uh, early march and um uh, but yeah, their white paper was actually published, you know, in uh, like a year or two ago. And so it's been around for a while. And I actually noticed that they have updated their white paper since our story was published. And the only thing they changed was they removed end-to-end -end encryption. <laughs> everything <laughs> else is the same. Is, is everything else accurate yeah, in your estimate? Yeah, I think so. Of the um, white paper? I think that it's accurate. I think that it still has the issue where it just doesn't go into as much detail as I would hope it would go into with a security white paper. Um, like Apple also publishes security white papers on like how iOS works and how it how it locks down the iPhones and things. And they go into a lot of detail about how the encryption works and how everything works. And I still think that Zoom's white paper is still kind of like hand wavy about the details. It's just sort of like, we're secure, trust us. Um, so uh, yeah, and actually one of the other big things was in the, in the user interface. Right now, if you like, well, I guess you're using mobile, you're using a phone, but on a computer, if you mouse over the little green lock in the corner, it says your client connection is encrypted. Um, but in certain uh, circumstances, if, if you use Zoom in such a way that you, um, we're expecting it to be end-to-end -end encrypted. So if you like didn't have anyone calling in on the phone, if you, uh, and things like that, then when you mouse over it, it used to say your connection is end-to-end -end encrypted, which was just not true because they were, um, they, they basically were, were redefining the term end-to-end -end encrypted to mean something that it didn't normally mean. Um, it normally right. means that participants are the only ones with the keys, but like some of the endpoints were like in Zoom's cloud services and that's not really how it works. <laughs> so, so let's call this. You did two stories on Zoom, right? Uh, or did you do more? I've only I've done two stories. Yeah. And let's call them story one and story two. Story one uh, took them how long to respond? Um, so, so they they actually responded right away. They I think uh, like the next day I think they published a blog post. Um, basically apologizing for being misleading about end-to-end -end encryption. And then, uh, uh, like, I mean, really for, 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 for both stories, their response was like immediate, which was, and this is, I think, where Zoom like turned around and started to be way more transparent about things and way more um, uh, like upfront and commit and starting to make commitments to focus on privacy and security. Um, but, uh, but yeah, their response was really fast and it was actually a pretty good response. That's interesting. So, uh, so story one was all about, uh, this was all about E2E, uh, end to end, uh, encryption. And but story two was, was something that, that snowballed into something else, uh, w w with the whole Chinese angle. I mean, it was an interesting catch. It was an awesome catch. Uh, but, but they came back with something, with a response that seemed credible. Did you believe them? The fact oh. that they added those Chinese data centers uh, because they had to deal with, uh, with, with increased demand in China. Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, okay, so the second story was about Citizen Labs uh, research, which is this, um, uh, these computer security researchers that do kind of public interest uh, research uh, out of uh, Toronto, Canada. And um, they basically found a bunch of issues with Zoom. And one of the big issues was that in their test call, where like one of the researchers was in Canada, the other one was in the United States, um, they noticed that they were uh, some, that, that some of the infrastructure for 
for the Zoom servers they were using were coming from China. And um, they were like, why would this be the case? And in fact, it was actually uh, the way that Zoom calls work. Um, there's a, uh, the participants join the meeting. There's a server that Zoom controls that generates an encryption key for the meeting and then sends it to the participants. And so this server that was generating encryption keys was in China and it sent a key to, um, uh, to at least one of the participants. And then they use that key to encrypt the meeting. Um, and so, yeah, what Zoom's uh, explanation for this was is that when COVID-19 was starting to um, uh, spread rapidly, it started in China. And so they had a lot of demand for working from home and working remotely in China. And so they really had to scale up in China fast. So they added a whole lot of new servers in China and they were, and normally they say, if you're outside of China, then you don't use um, Chinese servers, but they didn't actually like have that setting on a bunch of the new servers that they added. Um, and so by mistake, uh, th this was happening and sometimes you would be using Chinese servers, but then they said that they like fixed this and now you should never be using Chinese servers unless you were actually in China. And the reason why using Chinese servers is an issue at all, like it would be much less of an issue actually if um, Zoom were actually in pen encrypted. Because even if um, your traffic were going through China, even if the Chinese authorities were able to compel Zoom to hand over copies of your meetings, all they would be able to do is hand over encrypted copies of your meetings. So they couldn't spy on you without basically hacking your devices or somehow stealing the encryption key for the meeting. Um, but the fact that they actually generated the keys <laughs> in China was, uh, was a big deal. But yeah, I think that they were, um, I mean, their explanation made sense to me and they promised that this is not happening anymore. Uh, so how long did it take you to, to, or rather should I say, uh, from the time you published that story at any point in time, did you stop using Zoom? <laughs> uh, I have not stopped using Zoom. <laughs> um, I mean, so, so, so actually, uh, my 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 company, we uh, uh, first look media. We have this tech blog, and um, the security team. We published this blog post that's all about uh, developing a threat model for for video conferencing. And really, what the, what it means is is when you're thinking about what communication tool you want to use. Um, it's always, it, it, it's not like, don't use Zoom, it's not secure. Use something else that's secure. It's always uh, depends on the threats that a specific meeting faces. So if you, so like, you know, maybe uh, uh, certain types of meetings that you have are not very sensitive at all. Other types are very sensitive. Um, uh, you, you basically make a decision on a meeting per meeting basis. Um, and so, uh, a lot of the meetings that I have, Zoom is fine. And, and it's actually, I think one of the things about Zoom that is, is great is that it works really well. Um, it's very smooth and frictionless. Uh, people don't need, it, it's like really easy for people to use. Like it, if you start a Zoom meeting, you can send people a link and a bunch of people can join it. And it's like so much less work than so many other things. You don't need to have uh, like you don't even need to have software installed. Um, it works on all sorts of devices and all sorts of stuff. So for a lot of situations, Zoom is like great for that. It's just that, um, uh, but yeah, like basically like as soon as we figured out um, that Zoom's claim for end-to-end -end encryption actually wasn't real and that there was other like significant security issues, um, we basically decided to stop using Zoom for anything sensitive. And we're still not using Zoom for sensitive meetings until it seems like um, they actually start implementing end-to-end -end encryption. How far away do you think that is? Um, well, they, okay, so Zoom, they, their response has been very positive um, and they have been uh, very quickly fixing a lot of security issues. The problem with just enabling end-to-end -end encryption is it's not it's not so simple. It's uh it requires kind of like re like completely changing the architecture of how 
how things work. Um, and so, but I mean, I th but but like it's actually they're actually in a pretty decent place to do it. The way that the way that Zoom meetings currently work, um, uh, they're already encrypted using a key that all of the participants in the meeting share. And that's kind of like a prerequisite to getting an, an encryption working. Now they just need to make sure that they never have access to the key, that only the participants generate the key for the meeting. So I don't know how long it's going to be, but they have definitely been like they, they announced they're going to freeze all of the features that aren't security and privacy. They've already fixed a bunch of um, issues. Uh, they've improved the encryption. Uh, there was a, a kind of big encryption problem that the citizen lab researchers found. They've um, just released uh, like Zoom 5 that uh, like yesterday, I think, or the day before that uh, uh, that fixes this and makes I know it every time I restart Zoom, I uh, there are a whole bunch of new updates. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Downloaded, and all, awesome. these updates, all of them right now are all security and privacy issues. That's it. Because they're saying like they're not adding any new features. They're just making it making improving the security and the privacy. So it's getting a lot better. I don't I have no idea how long it's going to be before there's end to end encryption. Um, and once they're actually, once they actually do support it, I am probably going to have, you know, some healthy skepticism. <laughs> I'm going to like look into it in detail and try and figure out if, 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 if it works. Um, and also it would be great if they, if they really wanted to do a good job of, uh, it would be great if they made it verifiable, which means making it so that, I don't know, like, so, so Signal is an encrypted messaging app. Um, Signal lets you do something called uh, verifying safety numbers. I don't know. Have you ever verified safety numbers on Signal? No, um, I haven't. So most people don't do it. But basically, what it means is that you're able to compare QR codes on um, on your phones. And if the QR codes are the same, then you can be completely sure that there's not a man in the middle attack. If you don't do this, okay. then you have no way of knowing that, like, if you're sending me a Signal message maybe you're actually sending some attacker a signal message and they're just forwarding it to me. Um, but, if, but if we compare the keys that we actually have on our devices, then we can be sure that it's actually encrypted and no one's spying on us. Um, and it would be great if Zoom's end-to-end -end encryption supported something like this too. And so we'll see how, how that goes. Um, uh, but I don't know, I, I would hope that you know within months, um, Oh yeah, what, WhatsApp has that too. WhatsApp also supports uh, comparing fingerprints and verifying that your encryption works. Um, so I would hope that Zoom supports that. And I would hope that maybe their end-to-end -end encrypted feature will be available within months. Um, and also I would hope that it's, it's available for free, that it's not just like business customers. <laughs> that um, it becomes a separate billing uprising tier kind of thing. Yeah. And like the thing about end-to-end -end encryption is if, you ha if you're having an end-to-end -end encrypted meeting, it's not going to have as many features as the other ones. Like you can't call in on a phone, for example. Like right now you can call into a Zoom meeting on a phone. But if you're in an end-to-end -end encrypted meeting, the phone calls will be completely disabled because you need to actually use special, a special Zoom client to connect that supports end-to-end -end encryption and just like calling in from a phone, it's impossible to do that. And so there's, a, and, and also like streaming on YouTube or record or cloud recording, like all these things won't work in an end-to-end -end encrypted meeting. So Zoom will have to make it so that when you start, a, when you host a meeting in end-to-end -end encrypted mode, um, it works a bit differently. It disables a bunch of features, but, but like, I think that there's a real need for secure communications, especially when um, all of these, uh, uh, you know, communication that used to happen in person now just happens over the internet. And so there used to be, things used to be a lot more secure. <laughs> and now that everybody has to work from home, everybody has to go over the internet. And it's, and it's not like, I mean, we know from, you know, the, the NSA and the GCHQ and the Snowden documents and stuff, everything on the internet is being spied on all the time. And so it's, so, you know, we need to, use encryption to, to solve this problem. And um, I hope that it's available to everybody and not just paying customers. Yeah, the, the only challenge that I see is that video is much harder. Uh, I mean, there are a whole bunch of trade-offs when you develop, which, which is where I came from. Um, 
the reason that I'm probably on this call is because uh, of something I wrote on my newsletter with respect to Zoom, which is as a founder and a product developer, you empathize with the challenge that someone faces between uh, something that scales, something that does really well uh, from a product market fit perspective, which is that it solves the user's problem, get on a video call fast, make it really easy to join a call, make it really easy to invite someone, et cetera, et cetera. And these were unsolved problems uh, from, from WebEx days, right? And Zoom made it, spent say, 36, 36 to months or more solving these problems and made it really simple to do that. Uh, the problem that they didn't solve, which, which they focus on right now, is, is security. Uh, but 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 that's the trade-off that every founder or every product uh, developer or manager uh, faces, right? In, in terms of being able to decide what to prioritize in product development. Now it, it, it's fairly clear that these guys just have to solve security, uh, but and it's very clearly now a security uh, issue, but. But before it became a security issue, um, if I could split it up, it was a marketing and communications problem on one on the one hand, right, uh, and, and and a technical challenge on the other hand, and on the other and on the third side, it was an optimization issue. Uh, how do you optimize for speed? How do you optimize for concurrency for for thousands of video participants? That was a problem that none of the other products were solving for. So you actually had three different things going on at the same time. Um, how much of that do you see changing at, at organizations that are doing spectacularly well, such as Zoom, uh, which is uh, more coherence in terms of product, uh, of customer-facing uh, product? Yeah, I mean, I think that one thing that Zoom did differently than some of its competitors, so like Google Hangouts is, you know, a competitor of Zoom. Um, and I think that something that's very different is Google Hangouts, they also don't publish a lot of details about exactly how everything is secured, but they never made the claim that it's end-to-end -end encrypted, we can't spy on you. And I feel like that's the big, that's the big thing is like, if you read Google's privacy policy, they're like, you know, we only will share your information if we're compelled to by law and things like that. But they never, they never were like, this is totally secure. It's end-to-end -end encrypted, <laughs> and, and 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 Zoom was like that. And so I think that that's um, the the biggest issue is that I think that that the the marketing of it sort of just jumped the gun and was just like, oh, this sounds really good. Let's just put it all over our material, and it was very like buzzword heavy without actually, you know, being accurate. And so it's I think that that's that they could have just gone ahead without making it more secure if they just said up front, you know, in, in when when tons of people started using it, that it is what it is. Yeah, which I mean, which is what, like, this is how Slack works, right? Everybody uses Slack all over the place. Slack is an end-to-end -end encrypted, but they don't claim to be end-to-end -end encrypted and everyone, like, understands the trade-off. So if you're like, okay, I, I have a business, I have to... Um, you know, have different teams communicating. I need to have some sort of like chat with different channels and stuff. Slack has all these features that I want. Yes, Slack can spy on the messages. They can hand the messages over to the government, but maybe it's worth the trade off. What, and so, so I think that that's kind of, <laughs> that, that like, like people use Slack for, despite the fact that it's not very secure. And there's all other alternatives that are more secure. There's like Keybase, is an example of something that's kind of like Slack. You could have Teams, you can chat, um, and you could have Signal groups and WhatsApp groups. These are much more secure than Slack, but they don't have the same features that Slack has, and people might decide that they want to use Slack anyway. Um, so yeah, I think that that was like the big issue was really just being accurate and honest in the marketing. And so, like if Slack was just like, we're so encrypted, no one can spy on anything you say in Slack. <laughs> then, you know, maybe a lot of people would use Slack because of that, even if it's a lie, you know? Someone wants to know what broadband we're using. What are you using? What am I using? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm using um, uh, cable internet in California. Um, 
Xfinity Comcast. It's the, the, the town that I live in doesn't have that many good options, but it's, uh, I mean, I have, I have pretty decent internet. Um, yeah, in the United States, there's the ISPs are monopolies. <laughs> I, I have all full internet. I have ACD that just doesn't seem to work, which is why I'm on a geo 4G line right now. Um, and someone else asked if you are encouraged by the security changes that Zoom has made, especially post 30th March regarding encryption. I think we pretty much banged that question to death. Uh, the do you think there's a Chinese angle to this at all? Uh, do you think, what, what, what does this do for Zoom uh, in terms of positioning? What does this do for China uh, as, as the big bad guy in the corner? Yeah. I mean, I do, I do think that there's a Chinese angle to this because um, Zoom has a lot of... Uh, uh, I don't remember the details, but Zoom has, there's like subcontractor companies that do a lot of the development for Zoom that are based in China. So a lot of the engineers are, are Chinese engineers and then their infrastructure, some of it is in China. Um, and the reason why I think that this is uh, important is just because, you know, China is a very authoritarian government and they have no qualms on spying for political reasons. Um, but also to be fair, the U.S. doesn't really have qualms for spying for political reasons either. <laughs> and that's where the rest of the servers are. To be so, fair, most countries today don't have qualms. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, you know, I could definitely see uh, uh, being concerned for a number of reasons, including the fact that, um, you know, the, 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 the Chinese government helps steal intellectual property. Um, there's people, there's like Chinese uh, people all over the world who are, um, uh, you know, like like students studying abroad, or you know, people who have a lot of family in China who might, you know, be doing uh, some sort of active like pro democracy activism, and they really won't, don't want the Chinese government to be monitoring them. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of legitimate reasons to be concerned about the angle the the, the Chinese angle. Um, but I do think that if uh, most of, if you're outside, if it's actually true, if Zoom has fixed this problem, if you're outside of China, you're having Zoom calls um, and none of the traffic is going through Chinese servers anymore. And uh, I think that like, it's always possible that Zoom has some sort of deal with the Chinese government where they like help them spy on meetings. But I haven't actually seen evidence of that. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think that it's a problem, but I think that the, that the best answer to this problem is a technical answer, right? It's, it's securing meetings in such a way that Zoom, the company itself, can't spy on them. And if they can do that, if they could actually implement end-to-end -end encryption, then, when, then, you know, if, the, if Zoom can't spy on them, then Zoom can't help any governments by on them, including China. What do you think about the future of, of a lot of technology products? I mean, right now the spotlight is on Zoom because everyone has to use Zoom. I mean, pretty much, uh, uh, except for the holdouts who use Meet and Microsoft Teams, or who you have to use Microsoft Teams. Uh, but, uh, but there are, I'm, I'm guessing there are you know, uh, at least a hundred odd products out there that are extremely critical in the lockdown mode, probably going to be important going forward. Everything from help desk software to, you know, you, you, the entire gamut of SaaS collaboration, you name it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that isn't that secure. Um, uh, video is obviously far more challenging to secure, um, but 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 I'm guessing there are privacy issues, a lot of things where the spotlight is going to, you know, turn on a ton of these companies that, uh, in terms of context, founders talk about good problems to have and bad problems to have. Bad problems to have are you don't have customers. Good problems to have you have a lot of customers, right? Uh, and you can't them or you, 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 you screw up in so many different ways 
uh, that that you get the spotlight turned on you, uh, you know, for awful things that you've done or uh, the, the the Facebook friends to problem, so to speak. Um, how do you think this is going to pan out uh, in, in when the spotlight suddenly turns away from Zoom? Uh, to, to many of these companies, is it going to be a great time for you to be writing? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that um, like nothing is perfect. All of these things have have various problems, and I think that uh, the privacy and security issues, like we're just scratching the surface right now. I, I feel like we're we're you know moving into this world where people are really like just moving their entire lives onto the internet so much more than any, than, you know, has happened since the internet has existed. And, you know, when the pandemic is over, I think a lot of it's going to stay there, <laughs> you know? And so I think that there's, um, uh, and I think that it's really hard to like predict exactly how, uh, like what, what, what this really means in terms of privacy and security. But like if, if suddenly, um, uh, a couple of big services start getting like, you know, hundreds of millions of people or billions of people on market share. Um, that's like a lot of a lot of power and also a lot of power for the um, the governments that that uh, are have the jurisdiction of those services. Like, um, you know, like the U.S. government is able to basically spy on anything that happens on Facebook. And Facebook has a lot of customers all over the world, right? And so I think that like this problem is going to, um, uh, it's not going away. And it's and I think it's just a really challenging problem. How do we protect privacy and security when it's so easy to spy on everything online? Are you tilted away from the idea that um, that entrepreneurs can provide solutions? To many of these problems, um, I mean, do incidents like that reinforce a perception that the best solutions should be open source or collaborative, uh, uh, from the ground up, grassroots kind of stuff without either governments or um, agglomerations of capital called companies? Yeah, I mean, I think it's difficult. I think that in that most of the um, uh, like, you know, open source decentralized stuff is like, th there's there's a lot of really good advantages, but also a lot of times it doesn't like just work <laughs> like a lot of other technology. Like, so a good example is Jitsi Meet. Jitsi Meet is a um, open source video conferencing system. Uh, it's not end-to-end -end yeah. encrypted, although they're working on an end-to-end -end encrypted version but it's open source so you could host your own server. So basically you have to trust the server. So if you wanted to, you could run your own Jitsi Meet server and then use it for your internal communication. And that's like, that's actually very good. That's, that's you know, more secure than Zoom in a lot of ways. But also Jitsi Meet as a product, like if you have a meeting and there's more than like 15 or 20 people in it, it just starts to like break down. It doesn't work very well. It's like <laughs> some people, uh, uh, there's like a feature to blur your background. And if everybody starts blurring their background, then it just like crashes your web browser. And so like, and I think that this is one of the things that companies like Zoom and also other startups, um, they they have like, you know, a team of engineers that they pay a lot of money to fix these problems. Whereas the more grassroots open source stuff that might be good and uh, in a lot of ways secure, don't have, and then it also takes a lot of resources to like run your own server. It's so much easier to just... I, I guess it's also a function of momentum, right? So you have two examples, if I may, one, one you have uh, when Facebook had its moment, uh, uh, when, when, when they had embarrassment after embarrassment in, in terms of privacy issues. I think it was uh, 2014, 2015, I don't remember when, but but, and there, those responses were pretty delayed. Uh, at that time, you had a whole bunch of folks come out and say, you know, the way to do social networks is not like this. And everyone had their take on how to do a social network, open collaborative, you know, uh, de developed um, under the sunlight. 
and none of them took off, uh, flopped horribly. Um, uh, on I the other hand, you uh, have. I still use Mastodon. <laughs> I still it's use Mastodon. Awesome. Just... <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not going to ask uh, <laughs> what you do there. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I don't do that much. I use I use Twitter a lot more, <laughs> but still. Uh, on principle, I'm I'm guessing, but uh, <laughs> but the, but the point is, you you have you have examples like that, which is developed a little too late uh, and, and then can't gain momentum. Uh, you have examples like, uh, uh, you know, Linux, which was developed many years after people thought that, uh, you know, the OS wars had been won. You, you have, you had uh, Mozilla that was developed many years after folks thought that the browser wars had been won, uh, which, which then inspired, you know, Chrome, uh, but you have cases where open collaborative work has worked as long as it's won the platform battle, which is good engineering, obviously, but the ability to get into to, to widespread use. Um, I think that, that's the key challenge, which is that if you have software, if you have a felt need to have open, uh, for instance, video services, uh, that can create the momentum for widespread development. Uh, I haven't yet um, put together a hosted version of that video server. I've, I've actually been meaning to do that. But the problem, again, there is interoperability. You have to have something that's interoperable uh, with either other services or, or, or in a way that can rapidly, uh, that has inbuilt network effects and that could rapidly pull in people into that service. I mean, Zoom started somewhere. Um, so the question really is, are you going to have a whole bunch of folks getting, building, I mean, can you use paranoia for good is my question. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think that, um, I think that there is a big demand for privacy right now. And I think that, uh, that with, with Zoom, I think that they just didn't really have a big demand for privacy until now. And so I think that that's why, okay. yeah. And so, so I think that that's why they just never focused on it. Um, I mean, I don't know. It's always like, like, I'm a pretty big privacy nerd. And so I, I'm always like looking in, into doing stuff that is more private online on my computers and phones. But um, I'm, I'm not sure if there's really enough demand for privacy to, to really like fuel a lot of technology that like, like for example, I've, I've, uh, I've used special Android uh, distributions that are way more private that don't have uh, Google apps on them that and things, but it's like, it, I don't know, it's very cumbersome. It's very hard. I think it would be very hard for most people. Like you can't just like install like the Lyft app, <laughs> for example, um, which is, you know, something that a lot of people kind of need. And so, um, uh, but I do think that there is, there's enough demand and I think that the demand is growing for privacy as everything is moving online that, um, uh, you know, it, I think that even with video, with video conferencing, if there was some service that was like um, private that was competing with Zoom and that like worked well, that you could have meetings with like dozens of people, um, but it had like much better privacy, I could see that taking off. Um, as well, <laughs> you know, like right now, if they if they did a faster job than Zoom did, um, so yeah, I, I do think that there's uh, definitely an opening for companies to try and like do a really good job with privacy and security and sell that um, right now. What do you think about the uh, point of view that quite often when new technologies emerge? Uh, into widespread adoption. Uh, at some point, governments intervene uh, to claim their, uh, you know, their foot in the door, so to speak, to make sure that they can surveil, that they can spy, and they do it in in in, in ways that the general population um, 
uh, remain unaware for obvious reasons. Uh, do you see that likely to happen in a situation where working from home, remote work becomes pervasive? Governments will find a way, one way or another, uh, to gain access to this infrastructure, um, you know, to, to protocols, to figure out a way to access these platforms, no matter how secure they are, they ostensibly are. I mean, yeah, I think that it's definitely, there's a lot of value for governments to, to do this. And I do think that, um, I mean, I think that, that a lot of governments, um, definitely the United States and the Five Eyes um, and lots of other governments are, are going to try. I mean, this is like, like there's agencies whose job is to do this sort of thing. Those are the thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so, but then this is actually one of the places where, you know, open source technologies that become widespread and successful really help because it's a lot harder to, uh, uh, you know, secretly have like a secret deal between an open source project and like the NSA to um, insert some code that is going to have a backdoor. It's, it's, it's not that it's, it's definitely possible. Um, but uh, I do think that like open collaborative projects are much harder to uh, break in this way. And, and this is also like, like why, you know, if Zoom does make end-to-end -end encryption, I would love it if it's verifiable, if you can verify the fingerprints, because um, uh, it's because like if companies really, really care about this, if it's not just, they don't just want to have marketing about, hey, look, we're secure, but they actually care about being secure. They need to design their products in such a way that they are potential attackers. So they need to be like, okay, let's say we have a malicious employee that has access to all of our servers. Can they still not spy on our customers? Like that's what they have to do. And that's a very hard problem to solve, but it's, it's a possible problem, it's possible to solve. Um, and I think that like Signal has done an excellent job of solving this problem of making it so that like as a company, they don't have access to, they have access to as little as possible. Um, and everything is encrypted and things like that. So I think that that's an important, an important thing. How, how effective do you think it's going to be to protect against uh, the surveilling of metadata with respect to video uh, and, and other work that, that, that scales now uh, in this kind of an environment? Yeah, that's a much harder problem. <laughs> um, like the production of metadata, um, uh, like there are, you know, potential, like, so, so I keep talking about Signal. Signal has done some pretty interesting stuff to protect metadata, um, uh, where basically like, uh, it's called field sender. So if, if we have already started having a, a Signal conversation, um, if I want, if I send you a message, what I'll do is I'll send an encrypted blob to uh, signal servers and signal servers will be able to see who it's to, but not who it's from. So they'll just say, oh, uh, this is the recipient. I have no idea about anything else. And then they send the whole encrypted blob to you and you decrypt it and you're like, oh, this was the sender. Um, and so that's, uh, that's an example of protecting metadata. But like nobody else does that. This is the only example of actually protecting metadata on a service that I'm aware of. Um, but it, because it's a very hard problem, um, but it's but it's definitely a problem that people can solve. You know, like cryptography can do a lot of stuff. Um, but I think that for a lot of for a lot of businesses and a lot of people, it's more important to just be able to have a meeting that works than um, than that. But I mean, that's. I don't know. It's an important thing. Governments are interested in the metadata too. I mean, obviously, it's a question of how many people care enough about uh, about about their privacy. Uh, in India, we have huge debates about um, about unique IDs. Um, but I, I, I think at the end of the day, it, it's also a function of a culture of building product. Um, how, I mean, as, as, as a writer and as a geek, you are at the intersection of tech 
and entrepreneurship. Uh, what's your take on on everyone from Elon Musk to Mark Andreessen in Navarat Khan, and at least of Silicon Valley, talking about building as an ethic? Um, I mean, the reason I ask is because I think it ties in to many of these issues, including um, where everything can be solved by just building. Um, so, so let's see. I mean, I think that I am very skeptical of a lot of Silicon Valley solutions to a lot of problems because uh, a lot of the time, I don't know, it, it kind of reminds me of people thinking that like blockchain can just solve everything. <laughs> um, I, I think that um, like, you know, so for like the pandemic, uh, it, it seems like there's a lot of companies that are interested in starting to do um, uh, like surveillance or like, like I saw something, who was it? I forget which company, but, but they're like, I know we can do contact tracing by facial recognition so that we just, you know, record everyone's faces to figure out who they are and use cameras to figure out who was in the room with who and have giant databases of everyone's faces. And it's so, so I, I feel like tech companies are really good at building specific products, but they're not necessarily good at doing the right thing. <laughs> like, like I, I, I'm not quite sure if I think that Facebook as a company is like, is like an overall positive thing for society. <laughs> um, and so, yeah. yeah. So it's like, so, so I, I feel like definitely like they're needed. Like we, we definitely need companies that can uh, build good products that work, that can make it so that we could all communicate and, um, uh, and it solves real problems. But I think that we need more than that too. I think that we need, uh, uh, we need to make sure that, that, you know, it's not just tech companies getting to make all the decisions. I, what's your, uh, uh, by the way, we were discussing secure drop in the morning. Uh, has the number of tips gone up since you wrote the story? Uh, have you had more interesting leads? Um, I haven't, I haven't gotten, uh, many more Zoom tips, but, uh, <laughs> I mean, well, well, we have gotten some tips about like, you know, specific instances of Zoom bombing and things like that. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, like there's, I don't know, there's a lot of really bad Zoom bombing stories out there. Uh, but, um, but yeah, in terms of like, I think that the number of tips just in general have, has gone up since the pandemic started. Um, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on right now <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of people are talking about it. Are you ever going to write a third Zoom story? Oh, a what Zoom story? A third one? Oh, quite possibly. I mean, it just depends on um, if there's a good story to tell. Like, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in what they're doing right now on, on, on how they're improving things. And, um, uh, you know, if they, if, if they do a really good job or if they like do a really bad job, if they like mess up, in a really bad way or something like, yeah, I definitely think that that is in the public interest. And so, so yeah, I mean, it just depends. I, I, I don't have a, another zoom story that I'm working on right now. So I don't really have like a lead to follow, but, but, it, but yeah. It, it, there's a question that I actually wanted to ask you earlier, which, which uh, I remember now, which is, uh, has it always been engagement with PR? Uh, do you appreciate actually engaging with PR? Uh, have folks, beyond PR ever reached out to you, say in Zoom or other products in, in, in other companies where you've done investigative pieces? Yeah, so with Zoom, we've only talked to their, their PR people, but I really like talking to um, engineers. Uh, there's definitely, uh, I, 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 the, the 
PR side of companies are always, you know, they don't always necessarily give you <laughs> information that's like super useful, right? They give you like something that they think <laughs> will look really good. <laughs> um, but the engineers are like, you know, the people who like understand how the technology works, a lot of times will just be a lot more straightforward and just be like, oh yeah, it works like this. I guess that thing is possible. You know, we have these various issues. <laughs> and so, um, uh, yeah, there's definitely like, uh, uh, it's definitely nice to talk to people who aren't just on the like public marketing side of things. Do you reach out to investors or venture firms when you do a story about a tech company? Um, I haven't done that. Um, but I mean, I think that's not, not a bad idea. Most, most of the ways that I end up, uh, like writing about something like this is, um, I get a lead somehow and I start following it. So, uh, uh, so really like we weren't actually planning on writing this story about Zoom and end-to-end -end encryption. And uh, Yael, the other journalist that I wrote this story with, she was working on um, basically like a different unrelated story about um, uh, just about a bunch of these collaboration tools that people are starting to use now. And uh, she was, and I was talking to her about Zoom and about like what questions to ask them. And she like told me this quote that they gave her where they're like, Zoom doesn't support end-to-end -end encryption for video calls. And we were like, what? <laughs> and so then that's <laughs> what we were, like, decided to like dig into this a lot more because that was kind of a big deal, especially like then we go to the, like zoom.us slash security and it's like end-to-end -end encryption. <laughs> so. By the way, I'm putting this piece on Twitter because <laughs> definitely tweetable. Uh, okay, I have some random questions. Uh, someone, Pradeep Tiwari wants to know uh, your take on the new Google Hangouts feature. On the what Google Hangouts feature? On the new Google Hangout features. Oh, uh, what are the new features? <laughs> I actually don't know. Oh. Uh, um. I mean, Google Hang, so just, in, I'm not sure what the new features are. I mean, I think that there's a, um, uh, Google Meet is like the G Meet. Suite. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like the company, the business version of Google Hangouts. And um, I think that they're, because of the pandemic, they're giving like wider access to Google Meet. Um, I mean, I think that it's, it's a pretty good service. Um, it works really well. There's definitely been times where I've tried to have calls on like Jitsi Meet, the open source self-hosted thing that just like didn't work. And we kept having to try refreshing our browsers and there was problems. So we switched over to Google Meet. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but yeah, like it's, it's also not private. It's similar. It's like, who do you want to be able to spy on your meetings? Do you prefer Zoom spying on your meetings? Do you prefer Google spying on your meetings? And you just make a choice. Uh, do you have a view on government procurement uh, for products like this? I mean, before this started, we had the whole uh, $10 billion contract. Sorry. Um, do you um, think that there's a risk that Wait. governments will be forced, will, will insist on buying specific products, um, especially for video calls and, and what have you? Yeah, I mean, I do think that there's, there is a risk. I think that um, one thing that Zoom has promised to do because of pressure from this human rights group called Access Now is to publish a transparency policy, um, which, uh, a, a handful of big companies publish. And so Google publishes a transparency policy where they basically um, uh, regularly, I think every quarter, they update it and they say how many um, requests for user data they've gotten and how many of those requests they've complied with and they break it down by country. So I think that um, Zoom, so we right now at the moment, we have no idea how much governments around the world are putting pressure on Zoom to like spy on their users. We just don't know. We do know about Google. We do know about Facebook because they publish these transparency reports. And so for example, with Google, like, you know, the US government 
requests data from, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of Google accounts, um, you know, every quarter uh, and Google complies with those. But then, you know, the Venezuelan government doesn't get any data from Google. And so I think that this is a, a good thing to keep in mind. And this is one of the reasons why transparency reports are good because if you are Venezuelan and you're trying to decide like, what's the most secure video conferencing system, maybe Google Meet or Google Hangouts is a great choice for you because you know that your government isn't, isn't that Google isn't cooperating with your government, right? Um, and so, so, this, so I'm definitely looking forward to Zoom publishing transparency reports because I will be very interested to know like, how much does Zoom cooperate with requests from the Indian government? We just don't know, um, but we do know with Google. <laughs> and actually, I should look that up. I'm not um, really sure. <laughs> uh, Alec Aldrin Lafra is asking, how difficult is it to use end-to-end -end encryption in Zoom, uh, to allow end-to-end -end encryption, which is something that we discussed earlier, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, it doesn't support it. Um, so, so this is like a, you know, this is how difficult would it be, will it be for Zoom to, to develop this feature? Um, I think that Zoom is actually in a really good starting place to make end-to-end -end encryption, like the way, that, the way that Zoom meetings currently work. Um, uh, they, they're, they're, in a good, they're in a good place to, to add end-to-end -end encryption onto how their system already works. But basically the way that Zoom meetings currently work is there is a type of server that's hosted in the Zoom cloud that's like a key management server. Every time you start a meeting, the key management server creates an encryption key and then sends a copy of that key to all the participants in the meeting. And then the whole meeting is encrypted with that key. And so right. for end -end encryption to work, you need to get rid of the key management server. Instead, you need to make it so that like the meeting host generates the key and sends a copy of it to the rest of the participants in the meeting. And um, in order to do this uh, well, I think it, it might be like, there's a lot of things that can go wrong, but you know, they're hiring, uh, I, I, they've been doing these webinars, uh, weekly webinars about security and privacy updates that, that they're adding. And they say that they have like a bunch of PhD cryptographers working on this and uh, they seem to be talking to, you know, a, a, a bunch of, you know, very competent people that know how to do this. So I, so I definitely think that it's possible and it looks like it's in the works. Awesome. I think we've, we've been through an excruciatingly long one hour, uh, <laughs> as Karen said. Uh, I, I pretty much killed every possible question there was to ask about Zoom, I think. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Micah, for being on this call. Um, uh, there are actually a dozen other random questions that I did not ask you. Uh, and, and you thank me for that when you hear about those questions. But good <laughs> talking. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think we have any other questions from folks watching. Um, thank you so much again. Kiran, are you there? Yep, still here. And that's my kid uh, discovering that the meeting is coming to an end. <laughs> okay. So for everyone who's been watching, uh, thank you for being here. I think this has been a great one hour. And thank you again, my kind Vivek. So if you want to follow more on this, uh, I suggest going to haskick.com and signing up. Uh, we do not send notifications on the website right now, but we will do that soon. Yeah, and signing up is a great way to ask for updates when these things happen. Uh, this video has also been on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, although I think it's it's a bit late. So I don't know how many viewers we have had. Um, I don't think it's been a great night, but we have recordings. So that means we will make sure people watch this stuff because I think there's, there's been an incredible amount of knowledge that has come out of this hour and uh, it deserves to be in more years. All right, so for everyone who's been here, thank you. I think... Um, we shall end this year. Goodbye and good night. Bye.